Creatives with AI Podcast, the spiritual home of creatives curious about AI and its role in their future. Hey, Tanya, how are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm very good. I really wanted to talk to you on the show um, because I think originally I saw maybe some posts on LinkedIn or something like that where um, you were talking a little bit about what exactly AI does. And I I think it's really, really interesting. And considering a lot of the the challenges, I think, that artists in particular have with how the current generative AI works, I think you have a really interesting solution. And I wanted to dig into that with you a little bit to see kind of how you came up with the idea and all that. But before we get started, maybe if you just give a little bit of background. So like, how did you, how did you get to the point that you, you know, thought of, thought of doing this? Um, thanks, David. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to explore with you the challenges that creators are facing nowadays, because I think they're quite big. And there will be a bloodbath around AI and the copyright. It's, and it's the coming. You're it's absolutely coming. right. Yeah. Absolutely. And well, I'm a serial founder, I'm 37, and mother of four children. I moved to London in 2013. Then, uh, as a British correspondent, before that, I was an investigative journalist, a radio journalist, TV journalist, editor of the newspaper. Um, in 2013, I moved to London, uh, launched my first company. It was a QA website for experts to share information that's not published on the internet. Uh, the company went on quite well. It was acquired by Yandex, which is a tech giant. It's a competitor to Google. When yeah, I yeah. joined Yandex, I had an idea of what machine learning is, but like a very vague one, I would say. But I was a product leader of the search engine, so I had to learn that people were very helpful in helping me to understand how the technology, uh, computer vision and machine learning works. And then uh, at some point I realized that what I'm doing at my job is I always train and customize AI algorithms. And I have a team of at least 20 ML engineers who are taking my product ideas and putting them into place. And then um, after I left the company in 2022, you're stuck, so I'm making a post so it will be there to, to... Oh, Yeah, we're back, okay. And then, um, and then I left Yandex in 2022. Um, I, I was pregnant, got birth with my first child, like got my first child. I saw my journey. I thought, wow, that's an amazing tool, super cool. But it's one and the same thing happening once again. Tech companies taking data from the internet, putting in their technology, and then selling access to it to everybody else. And then they promise uh, that they will somehow compensate or reimburse. Um, everyone whose data was used, but that would never happen. That happened. This story happened to the me to the industry I was working on with. I was a journalist. This tech companies came. They really invented a very good ads algorithm, and the big data revolution happened. Hence, all the traditional media lost their advertising income. Journalists lost their their revenue. We're still trying to cope with the situation. We're not there yet, and. Uh, we can see what happens to the world where a very good industry doesn't operate. So now we have less freedom of press, less diversity of media and everything else. And you see what happened to the world. Now, I thought, well, 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 I don't want the same thing happen to art, what happened to journals. And then just the solution is super simple. Instead of like taking the data and training an algorithm, just give algorithms to artists. That's it. Make sure that any artist, no matter who he is, which background he has, can train their own AI. And then we will be living in the world with 20 million versions of AI instead of like three big companies having three big AIs trained on the artist data of 20 yeah. million people. Yeah. Sorry, I promise not to speak, but I'm very emotional about that. <laughs> no, please do. That's exactly what, uh, that's what this chat's about. Yeah. I mean, like I promised not to you prior to the conversation, like a little background, it is like, I promise not to pitch too much, but then when you talk about that, it's like, what's coming naturally. I've been interviewing one of our illustrators today. I usually run a lot of inter interviews to understand what's going on. And she said, her name is Barbara. And she said, look, I'm like, musicians are at least protected by labels. So they have someone to go to, to ask for help. Artists and illustrators are not protected by anyone. And then I asked like, what are you going to do? She says, 
Like I tried to delete all of the illustrations that I've published in my Instagram account and I wasn't able to do that. So I feel like absolutely vulnerable and alone. That's really interesting that you can't remove it. Um, I think it's a bug or something. My, 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 it can't be it's that a hidden, It's a hidden feature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it's probably at this point, it's probably too late anyway, because everything will have already been ingested and trained. Um, Obviously. Obviously. You know, so yeah. I, 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 yeah, it's, and this is the thing, right? Like, you know, the, the, the barn door is open and the horse is bolted already. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, the whole concept of it though is, is super, super interesting. And, and the, and the fact that you've been able to sort of deploy that in a meaningful way so that people actually can use it. Um, I know, well, I guess the obvious question for me then becomes is, is how do people know that their, their illustrations and their data are safe with you and what makes, do you know what I mean? What makes your tool different and how do they know that they're protected? And again, this isn't meant to be sort of a salesy type conversation, but that's the logical question, right? Is how to, how do artists feel comfortable that they're protected from what you're doing? I feel like technology wise, we are not there yet where we can say that anybody, anybody can feel protected. We're not there. And as much as I want to say, go to exactly and you will be protected. It's like steps towards the protection, but you never, you can't feel safe about that. And first thing is, yes, it's scary. If you're scared, you lose. So you can't be scared and you can't protect yourself. Instead of protecting yourself, you should weaponize yourself. So it's too late to protect anything. So I think this whole attitude, let's protect the artist, is not something that should be happening. When Martians are invading your planet with super lasers, so late to protect yourself, you have to weaponize and have the same lasers. Yeah, so, yeah. and that's what we're doing. So the biggest thing of like protecting is you can train your own AI on exactly. And you know what? It belongs not to me and not to exactly. It belongs to the, to the person who stayed, who is the owner of the data. So the most important thing is that we're trying to do, we're trying to make a market standard. Whoever owns the data owns the algorithm and that's the foundational idea of exactly. So if you come to us, if you upload your imagery, if you prove to us that you have copyright to this imagery, which means that it's produced by you or you're obtaining the license to train yeah. on this imagery, then you yeah. create an algorithm which belongs to you and everything that's created with this algorithm also belongs to you. So it's like you inherit the images that, that are prompted images inherit the provenance and the copyright and the legal framework of the images that are uploaded. That doesn't give you a protection, but it gives you a right to sell those images to the customers because you can't sell to the customer images produced with majority. They will buy it because they're scared that they will have a lawsuit against you. Now you can use the technology to scale up your production. The second thing is obviously the, the easiest thing that can be done there, you publish your AI algorithm and exactly Somebody comes to exactly, prompts this model, create images with this model, uploads it to exactly. Now the new model is published and then this person stole, has stolen from you. And the way we protect you against that is that we always publish small sized, smaller sized images that we're used to train an AI on. So that if you see that it's yours, but somebody whose name we, sh we showed use your images, you will know for sure. Because currently it's very difficult to understand which AI is a trend on which data, right? We make it absolutely transparent. And then the third thing is that when you train AI on exactly and you publish it under our T's and C's, you have to confirm to us that those images are yours. And if it's not, then you're lying to us. Then you, we are the victim of the, of the crime alongside with the creator who is actually like really a victim here. And then we partner with this person. And obviously if you're an illustrator, it's very difficult and expensive for you to go to court and to basically to say something. Well, with us, it's a bit easier. So, I mean, and this is the prevention thing because it's easy to steal from a child. It's quite difficult 
still for me, you know, I'm PC. So, and that's how on the legal side, the partner with those who are the most vulnerable here. Then there are some other things, but you need to know for sure if your image is published on the internet, I can make a screenshot of this image and somewhere or like of your Instagram, and they don't even have to be a big tech company, train a, a subversion of the model on your imagery. And now I can produce images the same way as you are. So you are never protected. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course. So I guess, so does that, do those models then run locally on someone's machine or do you, do you basically split that out on your end? And then you say, okay, because I guess what I was getting to with the last question was if you had one big model and then, do you know what I mean? And everybody's putting images in and then they get a piece. But I understand what you're saying now that it creates a whole new instance of a, of a pre-trained model with that's mm -hmm. ready to go, essentially waiting for some images to go into it. And then you build a, its own model there. So it's a custom model for that person. And then it's just dedicated to them. So does that, is that something that sits on your servers on your side and you manage that, or is it a, like an app that you download and someone does it on their local machine? It's currently on our side and we never thought that there will be a need to do it locally. There might be a need and we're open to that. And for now, uh, we're doing it on our side and I think it's cheaper for the user because we spend a lot of money to train an AI model for you and to generate images. In terms of the framework, we can do it either way. And to dig a bit into the, how AI works there, so the, 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 the basically what's going on on our end, we have a technology which is capable of understanding your style, and that's one thing. We have a technology that's capable of producing imagery from prompt. We never expose this technology that's capable of producing imagery from prompt to the user, to the end user, because it's useless. Because like you have yeah. you have other tools. And for us, I mean, not because we're so ethical, it's just like it's not how we generate revenue. Yeah. Like you have yeah, yeah. DALI, you have Majority. Their technology is much better if you just need to prompt just a random model and to get average image, go there. That's not our business. Now we have this technology. When you upload your images, we create a small version of AI. We pair this technology with your data set and the new piece belongs to you. Now this piece can be either exposed to external world. So you can publish it so that anyone can use it for a scene or you can publish it. So anyone can use it for free. It's up to you to decide, or you cannot, you can decide not to publish it. And some people don't want to publish their models. Most of them. They work for the clients, they write books or they do something. They keep it to themselves. The way we generate revenue is those builders of AI tools, of AI models and their data sets, they pay us a subscription fee. And for a subscription fee, uh, you can train your own AI and that belongs to you. And then on top of that, you can either publish it and generate some extra revenue. Instead of working as a freelancer for the company, you can just publish your model and get uh, passive income from people who want to promote right. your model. Why can you keep it to yourself? Because maybe it's more lucrative to you to keep it to yourself. Interesting. And what sort of reaction have you had from the, from the artistic community? Well, I think artistic community is in two camps now. It's against AI and pro AI. And I know that in some ads agencies or creative agencies, anti AI rules are so strict, so they don't even use like, reaching recording devices that, that then transcript something. And they can understand why, why they're doing it and they can understand the emotion. Obviously people who use exactly, they're more open. And I think that there are several reasons why people turn to exactly. One of them is, uh, we have an artist, a photographer, Nancy Olivier, she's one of the earliest users of exactly. And she said, apart from being a photographer, I'm a professional psychoanalyst. And I know that if you're scared about of something, in order not to traumatize you, this something, you have to explore it. So I decided to learn who my enemy is 
And then she figured out that there was evidence. She was like against us, obviously, in the beginning, but then she's our criteria, which is like very supportive. She's the foundational person for the community. The second, like uh, a quote that I've heard from one of the very popular French designer, he said, well, I look, I work at the design studio. I have young children working with me. He, he means like 19, 20 year old people. He said like, yeah, I knew what you meant. Yeah. <laughs> and he says like, look, they can afford themselves not to learn what AI is, but then 42, I need to know it. Another one, otherwise I will not be able to be in the business. And I think this is the attitude of people who have a s- serious career already and who've been in the industry of design. And that for decades, it's a very common thing that they're saying. One guy said, like, you know what? I've started to do design before and art before PCs were, were, were around. Yeah. And it was the same situation. And I just quickly realized either I learn how to use PC for my design and art or I'm out of the market. He said, like, I just, I have my savings, but those savings, I went and, and bought a PC computer, and that was the first one, and I don't regret. So, yeah, and that's one attitude. The other one is, um, well, I feel artists, typically there is a difference between artists and illustrators. Artists are not scared of AI at all. So those people who do conceptual art, modern art, just like copy me, please. Like, what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> you can do whatever yeah, yeah. you want yeah. with my model, and you can like play with it. They are very happy to see how like their oil paintings are copied or something because they never use it for as a final product. For them, it's semi research studies and a lot of things like that. And there is like there is no point in copying someone's art because it's so connected to the human being. And there is like you can copy it, please. Yeah, make one hundred out of it it's not diluting the fact that like with art copying art is not diluting the art piece because that's how art works yeah with illustrators it's quite different let's say you work for a brand and your job is to produce imagery in the brand style and you got paid to develop this style now the competitor to your brand from the different country comes scratches your data and that's the the company instead of hiring you just train the model on 10 images and now you, you lose your ink. Well, that's the problem then. That's the problem. And especially like illustrators, well, most of them are doing really well. I know people who make like 200K per month because they're very, very popular. Wow. Uh, but you, but it's like in the football, like top 1% yeah, 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 yeah. is making, top 1001% is making a lot of money. The whole industry is quite a tough thing to 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 do. And also this Varvara, she said, like, I've developed my style within 15 years. For 15 years, I was figuring out what's the best way for my characters to look like. How should I draw a nose? How should I draw hair? 15 years, I was thinking and perfecting this. Now it's like this copying. Like, am I scared? Yes, I'm scared. Yeah, no, it's um, it's interesting, and and it's also interesting. I guess no one's really talked about the difference between the different styles of artist, like illustrators versus photographers versus painters, and and that sort of thing. So it's interesting that that there's a little bit of a difference there, and I can totally see how that would be the case. Um, I was writing some notes while you were talking because I didn't want to forget to come back to a couple of things. One of them was is that. And I've mentioned this on a previous show before, but I mean, I remember when before digital cameras and there was the same discussion in photography about, well, is a digital image the same as taking a photo on film? And there was a lot of consternation in the photography community. And there were, you know, there were a lot of arguments and many, many beers were, were spilled over, you know, is that really a, is that really a photograph? And then then the knock on from that was then you had Photoshop. And then that was like, well, if you've, if you've done anything with Photoshop, it's not a photograph anymore. And then, you know, so we had to go through all of those iterations and I agree. I think, you know, AI as a tool is just another tool. I mean, even Annie Leibovitz came out and said, you know, she uses AI, she uses every tool available to her to be able to create compelling and beautiful images. 
And, you know, I, but I can see where someone like an illustrator, like someone, I guess, who does, who illustrates, let's say Harry Potter, right? Like that's the biggest probably series of books next to like Lord of the Rings and maybe, maybe a couple of others in the world. And the person who started and doing the illustrations for that in the beginning and all that hand-drawn custom design and all of that, you know, that is their style and that is the style of those books. And, you know, for somebody to go in and then copy that, that that's a huge potential issue. But I can also see where someone who does that, if they train a model on their style and then somebody comes back and says, I need some more art for Harry Potter and we've got this whole new series of things that we want to do. Can you do like they could use it for inspiration? Maybe they might not use those final images, but they could use it for some inspiration or to look and see what does this look like or, you know, how it might how something might work or not work. And I could see where that could be really, really valuable. It's like I was talking to Daniel Bedingfield the other day and, you know, from a mu musical standpoint, he loves AI because it's helped him actually be more creative because he can take crazy ideas and he can try it in 30 seconds and just say, oh, well, that doesn't work instead of spending hours working on something and then realizing that it doesn't work. <laughs> so it's interesting, yeah, that, that you were talking about that. And this is leading to a question. And <laughs> the other thing that I that came to mind is, and I know I have a friend who runs a gallery, and she always talks about the fact that a lot of artists who get older and maybe now are disabled and or they, they can't physically make the movements to do the art anymore have found a lot of solace in using AI to try and be creative again because they aren't able to do that. And so I was wondering if you had, have you had any stories or have you had any users that have come back and said, you know, this is amazing because I can't create anymore, but now I can because something happened. Maybe, I don't know, it could be they got in a car accident or, you know, or whatever. And then they say, well, I've trained it and now I can create stuff that looks like me. I think I have two stories like that. Cool. Uh, okay. But one, I... I'll be cautious of using names here, but of one course, is yeah. uh, what is a story of a, of a person who started to experience? Um, he was unable to move his hand essentially, and, and then at some point, uh, he was only only he wasn't even able to type, so he used this voice translator into into the interface, and for that for him being able to produce images in his own style. Uh, as during the times when he was capable of drawing uh, what he sends was something that basically prolonged his art career. The second story is a story of an artistic family and um, their mother sadly passed away and her son, uh, an artist, he trained AI on his late mother's work. I started to prompt it, and together with the sister, they were looking at those uh, new images. And he said, for us, especially during the first months of grieving, it was something that we were doing some, during some evenings, and it was as if we had conversations uh, with her. Then he published this work on social media, and the reaction was probably not, it was like different opinions uh, of people who one of them said that uh, it's uh, it's bad towards her legacy. The other said that it's a good thing. And he said, and but he said to me, like, you know, for me, it's a continuous conversation with a person and I see how her vision is reflected into something new. And I feel like if it works for him, that's enough and nobody can judge him. But then he said the funny thing, when he, then at some point he got annoyed with all these commentators of, of the Facebook and, and some, one of the artists said, yeah, but it's not a real art and uh, uh, anyone can do that. And, and probably he didn't like the style of the commentator who, who said that. And he said, well, you know, it's very difficult to train AI in your work because there is nothing to copy. So 
And yeah, that brings exactly. me, yeah. And so, <laughs> and probably like if we think about that in a broader context, artists previously, obviously, new technology always changes a little bit the role of the artist, or at least shows it with a new facet, and also it allows different people to enter the art world. So, if like in nineteen in seventy in seven in seventeenth century, if you can't draw. You can't make a portrait. So there are many people yeah, who maybe yeah. can do a great portrait. And we now know from the photography is that the skill of making a portrait is not about like making it very accurate, like likelihood. It's about capturing something different. Now we have photographers who might be very shitty in their sketches, but very good in photography. Same goes with, the, uh, with AI. And I think AI allows the new type of artistic persona to enter the scene. And this is an artist who is a curator. If you can mass produce images in your style, your job is to decide which one is which. And the other artist told me like, I'm still the artist. Because even if I have 200 images that generated under my prompt with my uh, model, it's still me who is choosing which one will go and which one will go to the to the bin. So artists today, because the scarcity of the image becomes lower, becomes tastemakers and becomes the curators. And curatorship becomes a more important thing. And But you're a creative director, you know it better than me. And it's, it's interesting that you say that no. because that's exactly what Daniel Bedingfield said about music. And he said you... You, you still have the trend makers and it's the trend makers are the ones. And, and that's, you know, you're as musicians, musicians are going to pivot a little bit because it is going to be easier in some circumstances to maybe to generate something. And so it's those people who can, who can pick the trends and pick the styles and understand and pull the stuff. It's the curators. Um, so it's very interesting that, that two people from two completely different fields have come to the same sort of conclusion as well. And I think you're absolutely right. And I, I think there's still a lot of hangover. And again, this goes back to the same thing that we had in, in digital, you know, with Photoshop and that is there's always this hangover. I think of people who, like I learned how to, you know, how to write code when I was in, like in the eighties, when, when computers very first came out and you kind of think, oh, well, I used to have to do this stuff by hand and it was really hard for me to do it. So because you're, it's easy for you to do it, that's somehow cheating. And I, I think every generation has that with the next generation that comes along because the technology gets better. And there's some sort of idea that because you didn't spend hours and hours slaving over something that it's not as worthy. And that's only because we slaved hours over stuff for years. And so we want to feel like that was worth something. But, you know, my son, who's in, in his teens, you know, when he gets to his 40s and 50s, there'll be some other technology and he'll be looking back and going, yeah, but, you know, we used to have to do this by hand and now it just gets done for you and it's not the same. And it's like, but it is kind of the same. Um, so I think that there's a little bit of that kind of carrying over as well, do you think? I feel so, but I also uh, feel that knowing how to do something from scratch is a very valuable skill. Well, for example, like I can know how to put plants into the garden, uh, kitchen garden, and then to grow them and then to make soup from scratch. And I feel there is a lot of value into doing this type of work because um, when you do it, it's another part of your brain that is thinking. And I think that when you're coding or when you're like writing manually, you would like with your hand with your piece of paper it's all about how you like play with your own brain and with your own skill set and human brains are well very very developed but very fun in in the way they're they're built so uh yeah and they feel like like this partnership with with human brain with AI, that what that's what make us like super beautiful creatures. We can't. We ideally, and I think that science fiction was always about how we take a human and how we put something in their literally in the, in, in their head, 
that will uh, upgrade them. Like in the Hitchhiker's Guide for the Galaxy, they would put a small fish, and yeah, now you right. can learn, and now you can talk and understand languages. But then tech progress, like we have this fish now, which is a chat GPT 4.0 with a voice, and you can, like, I can speak to, in Russian to you, and you will be able to quickly understand it. It's just the frustration is that it's not within our body, it's somewhere external. But I feel that our attitude towards AI should still be like it's part of the human body, which is not human body. Imagine how much more scarier AI would be, would have be, help me with the grammar. If instead, if the you, its form factor would be not a laptop, but injection of the of some liquid into your vein or a piece of tablet like a matrix or some operation yeah. there where they have to install a chip into your brain. So we're lucky that we don't have it, but it doesn't mean that yeah. this external is a threat. It's, it's still us. We developed it. Like, and yeah. let's just, yeah. And that's the problem. <laughs> oh, Human, come on. Humans are always the problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure computers will be the solution, but humans are always the problem because we're all flawed. We all have, you know, none of us are perfect. We all have our own biases. We all have different, but, but that's because we all had different experiences and that's what makes it great and amazing and fun. And, you know, it, it's that people are different and yes, we're going to get some weird average of everything in AI, you know, and that's part of the complaint. I think that a lot of people have about it is that you get mediocre everything but but mediocre is better than a lot of people can do in a lot of different subjects all exactly. the time and so i think we will we will eventually raise we will continue to raise the bar um and i think that's happening now is that you can't be superb in everything i mean i code not mediocre i code like very bad. <laughs> now, Same. with the help of AI, like, no, you, you probably, no, I'm worse than, like, trust me, <laughs> trust me. Now I can get to the mediocrity, but with some skills, maybe I'm like very high performing, but with the others, I'm below the bar. So AI helps me to be like, to elevate my average level. And that's, I think that helps a lot of, of people and that helps to develop things. And I think one of the things that happened with people who have dysgraphy or dyslexia, for example, a, like 50 years ago, if you're a child and you don't know how to write, people will say if you're stupid, you don't read books and education is closed as an opportunity for you. And especially like you're, you will never be able to join the job market. Then you have autocorrect, then you had Grammarly. Now you have ChatGPT. So a lot of the people who struggled with writing or a lot of the immigrants, like the whole, like, yeah. like I'm an immigrant. I will never be able to write in English the same way I write professionally in Russian. And for me, before like fundraising, for exactly, it was a question whether I will be able to enter conversations with investors because imagine like, like. Because when you're talking to a person in Britain, there is no problem with that. It's the country which is very welcoming to immigrants. But if you take any other country which is more hostile to different people, if a person is speaking the same language you're speaking and uh, makes makes mistakes, which I'm probably doing now, then you feel less of this person. You can't appreciate that this person is probably professional in something else. You degrade the whole. Yeah. And now we have yeah. like so many immigrants and migrants in the world and the attitude towards them was based on the way they used to learn which, well, now they don't have this problem anymore. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I hadn't really kind of thought about that before. And is it the same the other way in Russia? I mean, I think people are people and I think, yes, yeah, some places are worse than others, but is that a, is that a universal thing? Like if I, you know, because I'm a native English speaker, if I moved to Russia and tried to speak Russian and learn Russian, I would get the same thing, right? Like people would have a hard, they'd just be like, oh, well, he's an immigrant and he doesn't know how to speak Russian. And I would, it would be the same thing there. Or do you think they're, are they more welcoming or less? Do you think? 
Well, I think it's quite difficult now because Russia is obviously at war and it invaded oh, Ukraine. Oh, yeah. So it's not like hostility to immigrants is probably not the biggest problem that Russian society is facing now. But yeah, I think that, uh, and I saw that many times that when a person tries to speak Russian with somebody and Russian is not their first language, they learn the language. A person who only knows one language will always correct this person. And I was just like, why would you correct this person? Like this person is speaking like your language and that's like third language. This, But you always feel better about yourself when you're not making mistakes. And yeah, but anyways. You're, do you're doing just fine. Don't worry. It's, it's all good. But um, no, it's always, it's interesting. And I, I always find the language discussion quite interesting as well because even though i speak english i mean i always make a joke of it but people ask me if i speak multiple languages and i say well I, i'm fluent in american and i'm fluent in english and i'm not sure that i'm fluent in either one anymore because now it's all mixed up and i have no idea what i'm talking about but um but anyway um so to get us so, so to go back to something as well i'm curious to know your thoughts on where you think this goes where where does it go next i mean i assume that what we'll start to see and and maybe this is something on your roadmap i don't know but i could see where you could take this model and you can say well we've actually built this model around doing images but we could do the same thing for authors to say give it all of your writing that you've ever done and we can write stuff very specifically in your style and your voice mm -hmm. um, that's you know protected from the main model so, you know, other people aren't getting access to it. Like you have to spend the time to train it. But once you do, it's much more like you. Um, do you think that we're just going to see tons of specialist tools like that for all different aspects of our, our lives? Where, do, where, where does it go? Well, for me, the vision is that uh, usually, like I was always hiring, trying to hire the best people to work for my projects. And most of the times, if you try to to hire somebody you really like as a freelancer, they're busy. Uh, that's how you know that like the, the person is doing his job really that's well. That's how you know they're good, is you can never yeah. get them. Yeah. And at the same time, when people were trying to hire me for their products, I always were, were busy and I was always sad that I didn't participate in this, that, and that, because sometimes you have expertise and you want to use it to help somebody and come to... So many things are for one at the same time. So I believe that for me, the vision is that AI will open a new way of collaboration between people. I want to see people who have different, very, very cool skills to publish their AI models on exactly. And yes, it's not only about artists for me and not only about designers, but since you want to do it, like we've started so, so long ago, like, Pre-GPT, it was a different era. So it was very difficult to explain. I mean, professionals, the industry knew what it is, but if you will go outside, you being GPT, it was impossible. It wasn't possible to explain what AI yeah. is. Yeah. So for me, the vision is simple. Let's say you are a recruiter, or let's say you're going to a conference and you want to meet people there. There are 2,000 participants in the conference. You have five slots. You have to choose which five conversations that you have to, you you are able to have. And what will you do? You will like read through LinkedIn profiles of two thousand people. Well, probably it's not your first conference. Probably we know which connections work well for you and what not. Yeah. So instead of like doing it manually and doing it like spending your own time, you can ask the person AI to to sort at least five hundred guesses and sort out all of the rest, and then. You will do this. Now, let's say you're a recruiter and you're trying to hire the best product manager for your specific startup. You jump to the same. You go through LinkedIn and you look through those profiles. Now, let's say you're a recruiter and you're publishing your model of how you pre-select the data set on exactly. I can now hire you or rent your model out by your team and that you will say, like, you will say, like, if I work personal with you, I have to listen to conversations and to your brief. You will talk to me about that. Talk to me about this. You will, like, 
have another Zoom meeting just to understand that they work. Like you spend a lot of time when you're working with a client, yeah. like and talk yeah. about like and our directors never know what they want. So they do the job, you send it to the it's a lot of work. Essentially, when you work with a person, what you like this person, this freelancer spends twenty percent of the time on the actual job and eighty percent of the time to understand the client and to communicate the client. Okay, keep it for the number of hours that you have, but they will always be capped with with your life essentially, because you're a human being, you will die at some point, you won't be able yeah. to serve all the clients. Yeah. Publish your model that can do some certain thing and charge people who want to use this model but don't spend your valuable time on them and don't do the day job there while well, you can focus your creativity and your time on something that can't be done without you. And then imagine how many fun collaborations we will have. Now you can work with the artists from Mexico whom you don't know just because you like the, the model. If you want to test if it's working well, you don't need to ask you to make a test assignment. You can just prompt it. And if you like it, you just hire it. That's a new way of interaction. Imagine you're watching TikTok, but instead of watching the videos, you can prompt those people's models. It's so much better in exploring each other. I mean, people will understand more about each other and will be able to collaborate. So it's like Fiverr on steroids, to put it simple. Like now you have to go to Fiverr, choose a freelancer, pay for the freelancer, take a total amount of money, you could yeah. meet your yeah. kind of quality to work for you done, nobody's happy, everyone wasted a lot of time. Do it on exactly. That's pretty cool. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. And that that kind of gets around to I'm trying to remember who it was, but somebody was talking about, you know, we're, we're all going to have personal assistants and what we're going to end up with is our personal assistants are good. Like my personal assistant will deal with your personal assistant to book the podcast recording and we won't have to touch anything. Like literally we'll just say, yeah, we want to do it. And we'll just tell our systems to go and do it for us. And it'll just, it'll sort everything out on our behalf. And how does that, you know, in the marketing world, there's a lot of discussions about how do you move from a world where you're marketing to a human to now you're marketing to an AI, because now the AI is making some decisions on that person's behalf. And so that person may never even see an ad for something or it, you know, or, or, or experience that discovery. So how does discovery happen? when it's all AI and AI is just discovering other AI. So I think that's a really, there's a really interesting wrinkle that kind of goes along with that as well. It's like literally how does that happen in the background? And um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about. It's interesting to think about. Well, and first of all, about do you, the advertising how do you, algorithms. Uh, I used to work for the company who was optimizing ads for users. So the job was to show you banners that you will click and you, yep. a naked human being with your naked, vulnerable brain, who is like not protected by anything is exposed to AI that optimizes for you. Is that fair? Well, I feel like human brains are so fragile that you can't just do that. So I'm sure you would rather have your own AI that's facing the ads algorithm and then make selections. It's like being on Tinder when you are chosen, but you don't have a choice because Tinder is two-sided algorithms. It has an algorithm optimized yeah. for you and for yeah. the other person. Now, in, in the ads world, humans are like people on Tinder without a choice. So you have to go to a date with everyone who chooses you. Probably it's not ideal. Now, in terms of like whether my AI will be talking with your AI in this podcast, I don't see this happening. I think that after, after 2022, we probably had a very um, exaggerated expectations from AI because we saw, oh, like ChatGPT is doing this and then this and this and this. There was a lot of magic and then there was a conversation about general intelligence and stuff like that. Well, probable general intelligence is already here, depending on how we define it. And also, like I think that in two months after ChatGPT was launched, the expectations were that, like now, I don't know what, like. The new type of fuel will be discovered. Climate change will be solved. The wars will stop. Or on the contrary, we will all die because nuclear war will start. 
Well, yeah. ChatGPT or any AI is a simple algorithm that's exposed to the data, learns the pattern, and then generates something by multiplying a random number to this like other number. And that's like, like don't have a weird expectation. And that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, you're right. And um, yeah, I'm conscious of time. So maybe one one last thought from you is. You said you've got four kids. So what what type of a world do you see your kids moving into? And what do you think, like, how do you think AI is going to impact their world that they're, you know, that they're, they're going to have to go out. They're going to have, I don't know how old they are. I have a 17 year old, so he's just getting ready to go into work and they're going to be going into work soon. And what type of environment do you think they're going to be moving into? And what do you tell them about it? Well, my, my eldest one is 16 and um, I think that like obviously we're thinking about like what's next and have a lot of conversations with, with like with the 16, 17 year old child, you can basically pull. Um, yeah. And I think that like the type of conversations we have with Timothy, he usually says to me like, look, mom, you've been born in like 1986, Berlin Wall just fall down everything like everything was okay that like european union and was out like everything was like post-war and well people were in europe and america were preparing to leave and like the world where everything's fine now look around you look at the politics in europe and people who vote for some kind of weird people and those weird people says that like Nazis probably not always were yeah. wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and she's like, and he said like you've been very lucky to, and we probably are less lucky. But what I think is, I I feel like everything will still depend on the education that you have and the curiosity and moral qualities. And I don't feel like that there is such a shift in what's going on. So it's definitely not something that we should prepare our kids today that our parents didn't do with us. So I think the basic uh, values and universal things, just like be kind, work hard, respect the community, and just uh, be curious and read a lot of books and play a lot of video games will always help. I love it. That's an amazing place to stop. Tanya, thank me. Thank you. Thank me. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank David, me. Actually, I would like really, to thank David, me. Actually, David, <laughs> really, thank you so much. It was like a very, very nice conversation. Thank you. And <laughs> thank, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. Um, I will have links in the show notes and everything, all of that to to exactly AI so people can go and try it for themselves and hopefully sign up and, uh, and experiment and play around. And um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, have a great afternoon and the rest of your day. And it was a, uh, yeah, it was lovely. Great conversation. I'm really looking forward to getting this one out. Thank you, David. Thanks. Have a lovely evening. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye. Creatives with AI is a proud member of the AI Podcast Network. To stay up to date with current episodes and show information, subscribe to their newsletter at podcastnetwork.ai. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast platform so you'll always get the episodes as soon as they're available. Thanks again for listening and stay curious. curious.